Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 255. Sotl. Sotl. Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Let me tell you how we got here. The wonderful Hildy has been in correspondence with me. Hildy has been a long-term friend and supporter of this vlog series and you rock Hildy. And Hildy has just done an academic interview. Well done, Hildy. And she'd used my very, 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 very early vlog on how to do an academic interview. And she answered and practiced all the questions I presented in that vlog, went into that interview, all those questions appeared, she answered it, she did well. But then Hildy went further. In her email to me, she said, all the questions that you presented in that vlog came up, fantastic, great. But I had an extra question that didn't come up in your vlog. And I got the question, it involved something like scholarship and teaching. And so I offered some sort of answer about pedagogy and improvement, and it seemed to go okay. But Tara, could you talk about the scholarship of teaching and learning, because it looks like that's now a pretty big deal in academic interviews. Hilde, you are a legend, you are a head, and you are absolutely right, because Sotl has become big, very big, in the last five years. So you are absolutely on point for your request of me, Hilde. And further, I did want to talk a little bit about academic promotions as well. So, you know, subtle, important when you do an academic interview. It's now become increasingly important in academic promotion. So if you want to, you've got an academic job and you want to be promoted, this is now a big thing. Now, I've been on academic promotion committees since 1995. Anything that could have happened in a promotions committee, I have seen in its full horror. But there is no doubt that in the last four years, Sotl has become a thing in these promotions committees. Wasn't five years ago, is a real thing now. So let me explain. When you apply for academic promotion, you are assessed on four variables. Teaching, research, community engagement, and university service. Now in the old days, five, <laughs> five years ago, Teaching was assessed in these promotion committees by, you know, like the annual student reviews, the course reviews, nice unsolicited emails from students, maybe a nomination for a teaching award, maybe a teaching award. And they want to go, oh, look, yeah, good teacher, cheers, right? But in the last few years, I've noticed that suddenly all these new requirements for teaching and learning have started to appear in promotions committees. So let's use some cases. So for example, a, a, a person has applied for promotion and they've made a good case. So there's some good curricular development, some innovative assessment, and the students like the teaching. So we go, oh good, that looks good to me. And then some hashtag random in this promotions committee it mutters an immortal phrase, something like, I don't see any subtle, I, I don't see any subtle, I, I don't see any national or international confirmation of the quality of their teaching and learning. Okay. Right. So let's be clear. This is all very new. Being a great teacher and developing great learners used to be enough at a university. It's not enough anymore. Sotl has appeared. Okay, here we go. So if you are interested in getting an academic job, and say you get an academic job and you're interested in being promoted, then Sotl matters a lot. So Hildy, rock and roll, let's do this. And let's start with what is Sotl? And can I say, intellectually, this is a very, very interesting area. And it is useful for our careers, which is great. It does improve teaching and learning, but it is important if you want a career in this business. So the scholarship of teaching and learning, and I know this will come as a surprise to you, is the study of teaching and learning. It begins with, though, with an identification of an issue or a problem. 
So what happens is something happens in your teaching and you go, oh, that's an issue. You then transform that issue or problem into a question. You gather evidence, offer arguments and analysis and conclusions from that evidence. You then disseminate this material publicly and that enables not only your improvement, but it benefits others and enables their improvement. Okay, that's subtle. The key first question, and let's get straight into the controversy, shall we, is what actually is the difference between research in the education discipline and SOTL, the scholarship of teaching and learning. So the research that's in the discipline of education, what's the difference between that and SOTL? That's the big controversy. And the answer actually is quite a lot. SOTL emerges from our discipline. Okay, so physics teaching, history teaching, social work teaching. It recognises first and foremost the disciplinary parameters and specificities and allows the problems, the questions and the evidence alongside epistemology, ontology, methodology to be nested in and to emerge from that discipline. So education as a discipline, and remember I'm saying this as someone in one of my many previous jobs, I was a professor of education and I was a head of school of education. So, you know, I've got some form in education there, but, can, and of course I research higher education studies. Now, I have a critique of education as a discipline because it assumes that the evidence and the arguments created in that discipline of education is generalizable beyond that discipline. And I don't think that generalization is the case, colleagues. Now, don't get me wrong, education research has great value. But education in early childhood education, primary, secondary sectors, VET, higher education studies, inclusive education, technology in education, pick a trope or an area, literacy education, it's not generalizable because those issues, that all that great research that's occurring is not necessarily relevant at all in an honours course in physics. Full stop. So education research, research works with education tropes in the education discipline. And that has great value, tick, thanks. But SOTL commences with a discipline of knowledge and explores teaching and learning from within that disciplinary bias, lens, framework. As the great historian David Pace has stated, and this changed my life by the way, quote, a consensus has formed within growing circles in academia that there is scholarly research to be done on teaching and learning, that this knowledge must be shared publicly and should build cumulatively over time, and that the explorations should be conducted by academics from all disciplines not simply those appointed in schools of education. End of quote, David, you're a legend. Now I like this strategy, I believe in the strategy, this makes sense to me, because it stops the generalizations. It stops the assumptions of representativeness in teaching and learning that simply does not exist. And remember, I'm saying this as someone who holds a bachelor and a master's degree in education, but you should also note that I attained those qualifications after I finished two bachelor degrees, two other master's degrees and PhD and a PhD in different disciplines. So I did different disciplines, then did the education qualifications. So as you can see, SOTL works from and through a disciplinary lens and it reads teaching and learning through that lens. SOTL has one aim, yeah, one job, has one aim, and that is to improve student learning, full stop. It's particularly popular in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Canada, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. 
those nations sotl big it is moving beyond those nations but you can't get outside of sotl in those nations and when we start to deal with these national sotls that's when we get the even weirder word maxim i sotl i sotl <laughs> international scholarship of teaching and learning and there's an i sotl organization journal conference website right so it is a thing is this a thing yeah this is a thing so if you want to have a look for your own possible publications or what this research actually looks like when published I draw you to the International Journal for the scholarship of teaching and learning good journal long-term journal high quality journal so subtle is not just sort of like a reflection a reflection on your teaching and learning practices it's not a reflection it may start there, but it aims to transform teaching and learning practices. So this is where we start to hear phrases like research-informed teaching. So subtle and its dissemination ensures that the teaching that we conduct in our universities is informed by research, but also that the policies that we enact about teaching and learning at an institutional level are not a vibe, are not a series of assumptions, not an ideology. Sotl, therefore, has a very interesting history. It's 30 years old, 30 years old. It's often seen to have begun with Ernest Boyer's 1990 report for the Carnegie Foundation, and the report was titled Scholarship Reconsidered Priorities of the Professoriate. Great report, can I say, through time, old report now, still holds up. I read it again for this vlog. It's a good report. So this report probed how we learn and how we teach and how those two variables sometimes don't meet. <laughs> so Sotl commenced with the focus on the individual academic teacher. And the reason why it starts with the individual is because we need to always remember that the overwhelming majority of academics in our universities do not have any teaching qualifications of any kind. Now why that matters is if, if you've got no qualifications in it, you don't read in the area of, of research-led teaching, then how remotely do you know what you're doing? <laughs> Seriously, okay, so you haven't been trained in sort of teaching and learning, you don't know how to do an assessment, you've got no idea about interface management and educational technology, multimodality, you just don't, right, so you don't know. So you don't know what you don't know, so how do you actually teach? <laughs> and of course, the answer is how you improve is through SOTL, starting with the individual, right? So it commences with what you're doing right now, individual practices and your imperatives for improvement. And it's associated with enhancing student learning. That's the point. Now, SOTL in our universities, pretty well internationally now, is having an impact. And so whenever you hear the phrase communities of practice, that would be subtle. Whenever you hear about disciplinary literacies, hello, that's subtle. Whenever you hear the phrases research informed or infused teaching, undergraduate research, student engagement, whenever you hear these phrases, you have just hit subtle. So at its best, subtle operates on three levels. Firstly, and you must not stop at the first level, by the way. Uh, the first level is the micro level. This involves academics engaging with their students and improving the disciplinary parameters of their teaching and learning. The meso level is where universities and institution uses SOTL to develop strategic plans, staff development, and yes, promotion, meso level. So instead of, and I'd like this by the way, this is a good idea, because instead of sort of repeating these weird platitudes that we see around the world in strategic plans and my personal favourite, vision statements, Sotl, 
Sotil allows some actual stuff to happen, right? So, so these priorities are tethered to real goals, real outcomes, and is exploring how those outcomes are constructed from what's happening in a classroom or curricular design. So it's actually real and there is a process there, and that's a good thing. Meso. So now we hit the macro level. Sotil operates throughout the entire international higher education system. It impacts on how our universities are regulated, how our universities are governed. And at its best, university policy works really well with international Sotil because it, it creates really good policy because it does not assume that what exists and operates in biology has any relevance in physics or mathematics or art and design or social work. And it does not assume that the assessment that works well in physiotherapy will operate effectively in public health discourses. It doesn't assume that these tropes of quality will move between disciplines. They may, but you've got to prove it. So therefore, I love Sotil because it is respectful of disciplinary expertise. The critiques of Sotil are also many, and I agree with a lot of these too. It, it is too focused on individual practices. Remember, it starts with the individual. The challenge is a lot of people with their Sotil, it's about me and let me just tell you about me and have I told you about me recently and it's about me and I'm terribly important and it's about me. And, and so it doesn't get beyond that micro level. So that is a huge and important critique of Sotil. You've got to kick it upstairs. You've got to move it to something bigger beyond yourself. And also the definitions of Sotil are ambiguous, but I think from what I've been reading, particularly in the last three, four years, as it is getting big, the definitions as they're existing in policy are starting to solidify a bit more. Also, I think the disciplinary parameters do block generalisations about higher education. There are a large group of people that want to make these sweeping statements about international higher education. They want what exists in biology to work in English or work in history. And they want it to, and of course you can't generalise this stuff. These are not necessarily representative data sets or generalisable data sets. This is a different epistemology and different methodologies, right? So generalisations about teaching and learning are quite difficult to configure from Sotil. There's also a strong critique in methodological terms of Sotil. And again, I agree with this critique that Sotil has been way too wedded to case studies as a methodology. And of course, case studies have a series of weaknesses as well. But again, so they're the challenges and we can address those, I think. But the benefits of Sotil are many. Student learning improves. Hello. Students engage with research as undergraduates. So students start to hear about research from first, second, third year. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. The practices that we create in Sotil enhance curricular development. The relationship between teaching and research is confirmed. For me, that's everything. What makes a, a university academic different from somebody working in further education is that we both teach and research. So Sotil confirms the relationship. Cheers. So that means that the great ideas in teaching and learning circulate through publications and inspire and assist other academics. Therefore, the final little bit of the vlog today talks about you and Sotil. So how can you take today the teaching and learning that you are doing even in the midst of your PhD, perhaps as a casual or part-time teacher, right? How can you take the stuff that you're doing today and transform that stuff into scholarship of teaching and learning? Yes, you're going to help yourself. <coughs> yes, you're going to help your students. But increasingly, this is going to be crucial to get a job. And when you're in a job, it's going to be crucial to help you get that promotion. So how I instruct or try and help my mates and my friends, and I take this advice myself to be honest, is about one in 10 articles that you write. One in 10 articles you write, you create a subtle piece.
right? And that's important. So yes, you've got all your disciplinary research and that's crucial. And so get all those articles out, do it. Punch, 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 get them out, go for it, lift, come on. But one in 10 have something about scholarship of teaching and learning on your CV. And that will stop the absolutely, I would argue, pretty dreadful commentary that emerges in these promotion committees where, hmm, eh, they, they seem to be a good teacher, but I'm not seeing a dissemination of best practice. And the thing is, I taught first years for 20 years. Okay, hi to everyone teaching first years. You are legendary. Respect. So I know when you are in the middle of teaching hundreds of first year students, assignments are everywhere. Emails are everywhere. People are everywhere. Okay? And you are not waving. You are drowning when you are teaching first year students. So I get that and I respect you. I respect the work you do every day. The work you do matters. First year teaching, crucial. But I'm going to force you to do something for me. I know people are everywhere, right? I want you to open a file for me on your computer. Open that file up. And as you realise something is working in your teaching, that, oh, that's an innovation, I want you to just throw that idea in this file for me. Whack it in. Oh, that's an innovation. Or, that's interesting. Or, gee, that didn't work. I wonder why that didn't work. So just start to have a file where you dump ideas about teaching and learning into that file. And therefore that means you can return to that teaching and learning, that subtle note file, when you need a new idea, a new reference or a concept. So as you can see, subtle frequently starts with a problem. And let me give you an example. This is a good example uh, of Sotil and how it emerged. And it emerged from my wonderful late husband, Professor Steve Redhead. Why this matters is Steve had no teaching qualifications at all. So he had, you know, an incredibly long and distinguished career and he learned on the job. You know, he had a, the classic legal career, had a law degree, had law masters, law PhD, right? Okay, so that was the parameters. He taught through experience, he learned on the job. And so this is a subtle experience of somebody who didn't have educational qualifications but realised something was going wrong. So here we go. So Steve was teaching law in a university in Canada. And it became very clear, as it became very clear to me teaching communication in this same university in Canada, that the students were completely and utterly unprepared. Okay? To be frank with you, and I'll be really honest, those students had not read enough in either law or indeed in communication. They had not read enough. And there was unbelievably no growth between the students that we were teaching and marking and assessing in first year and the students we were teaching and marking and assessing in fourth year, four years of a degree. And there was no arc of improvement because they weren't reading enough. So Steve was teaching jurisprudence <laughs> to fourth year law students. And it became very clear to him when he was teaching these same students in the previous semester, the subject cultural studies of law, that their ability to read and write and interpret theory was completely lacking. There was nothing there. So what we did is, that was a problem. So what are we going to do? Jurisprudence. So we worked on the assessment options that could be possible for this subject. And we created something completely new. And we termed it cascading assessment. So very, very small assessments that would lead to a huge project at the end in jurisprudence. So it meant that the students would gain confidence and that confidence and the reading and ability would cascade into the final assignment. Now, some people refer to this as low stakes assessment. I hate that phrase. I do not use it. I think low stakes assessment, with the greatest respect to colleagues, is part of what is causing the problem in our current university sector. Because nothing should be low stakes in a university, to be frank with you. Everything should matter. And I think we're lulling students in that sense of sort of, oh, look, it'll be okay. It may not be okay. You have to work hard in university and you have to read. So we, in this model, these were very, very small assignments, but they weren't low stake. They were 
hard, difficult, complex assignments. And they included 500 words on a theorist, a thousand words on a theory, a thousand words on how that theory moved into socio-legal studies, and on we went, right? So these very, very small assignments, cascading assessment. And the student improvement was absolutely extraordinary. Most, most students improved over 20% in their marks from that first assignment to the last one. Some students improved by 30%. Extraordinary. And more importantly, and this is actually more important as the marks and stuff, but students left a law degree able to understand jurisprudence, which is pretty crucial. So, okay, individual practice, problem, out, solution. Cool? We're at the micro stage, right? Then, the goal was to disseminate this assessment and curricula strategy. So we recorded a podcast that legal academics around the world have used to enable their own process. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of downloads of that podcast on cascading assessment. And of course, then I went on to cite that strategy that I sottled strategy in my research on how to manage academic integrity, plagiarism, how to manage academic integrity without turn it in. So how to manage academic integrity through curricular design. So again, it then appeared in the refereed literature. So as you can see, so that's the model. So this may provide a way forward for you. What is a problem today that exists in your teaching and learning? Now, for me, for 20 years, and you've already heard me have a bit of a grumble bum through this vlog, for me, the problem that I have so many difficulties managing for the last 20 years has been a lack of reading, a lack of expectations of reading by students in an undergraduate degree. So, I can just grumble bum about it, and I do a lot, but I can actually do something. So what I did, wow, about 15 years ago for the first time is create a first assignment that I called the Annotated Bibliography. So I demand that students read and find 20 sources of different types. So refereed articles, they have to find grey literature, they have to find a YouTube video, they have to find a scholarly monograph, they have to know what a scholarly monograph is. So it's very directed, but it's an annotated bibliography. And this ensures, firstly, that the student's referencing is correct, they can paraphrase correctly, and that they are learning and scaffolded to learn information literacy. Now, I've used that annotated bibliography assessment in a range of publications around the world, and I show how information literacy can be enabled through that process. Right. So, and I, plenty of stuff you want to have a look at. The, if you put in Tara Brabbers and annotated bibliography, you'll see that work. So, in these vlogs, I often talk about going meta. And I think you might have worked me out. These vlogs, of course, are actually subtle. I sottle. And what I ask us all to do every week is just take a breath, take a step back, and look at this situation in a different way. And that's the project of Sotl. It is structured through problem, design, inquiry, evidence, analysis, but it doesn't stop there. It then says, what is the contribution to knowledge, and how is knowledge transformed through what I am doing here? Sotl also enlarges who we are as intellectuals. We confirm that yes, we are scholars in our disciplines and we are proud of knowledge. We are proud of those disciplines as we should be. But also, we are scholars of teaching and learning in those disciplines. So, to get yourself mentally organised for Sotl, remember to always base the concerns in students and student learning. It is based on deliberate design to intervene in taken for granted practices in your discipline. It is then systematically implemented and then evaluated. Sotl probes the effectiveness of that intervention through evidence. So it contributes to international practice and also your institutional practice. 
And finally, the great thing is, Sotil is public. You share your scholarship of teaching and learning to enable the teaching and learning and research of others. And further, it leads to all sorts of innovative questions about what research-led teaching actually is and where it can take us. Now, Trigwell et al. describe Sotil as, quote, making transparent how we have made learning possible. That's powerful because transparency is integral to what we do in teaching and learning. It's also integral to research. But I'm always most convinced about the value of Sotil when I remember the words of Lee Shulman, the wonderful Lee Shulman. And he stated, and I get quite emotional when, when I read this, and I'm using this piece, by the way, in, a, in an article I'm writing today after I've recorded this vlog. And Lee Shulman stated, scholars of teaching and learning are prepared to mess with the world even more boldly than their colleagues who are satisfied to teach well and leave it at that. They mess with their students' minds and their hearts and they instruct and then they mess again to examine the quality of these practices and how they could have been more effective. They insist on stopping at the scene to see if there is more that can be done. End of quote. That's the point of a university. I really get emotional when I, when I read that and when I, I read it out loud. We as academics, I suppose, at its most basic, we're paid to deliver content. <laughs> And I know we're not given enough time to refresh our courses, to mark assignments, to care as we would like for individual students. We're not given enough time. Those days are over. That ship has sailed. These challenges are real. But then there are those courageous, difficult scholars who decide that they're going to mess with the world and they insist on stopping at the scene to see if any more can be done. So that means that subtle scholars are not bystanders to mediocrity. For me, the future growth in subtle will add a lot of methodological complexity, moving beyond the case studies, moving beyond a particular mode of qualitative empirical research. I want to see the theoretical research and I want to see the development of disciplinary literacies. That's what I want to see. So for me, there is one question that continues to inspire me every day and it may inspire you. What is your role in learning? What is your role in learning? In answering that question, we realise that teaching is personal. Teaching is professional. Teaching is intellectual, but teaching is also social. Sotil starts with a belief and tests that belief through research. So Hildy, welcome to the scholarship of teaching and learning. Start in your PhD and through your career to just build a few publications in teaching and learning and show how your practice has transformed and how you are transforming the practices of others. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.